So cultivation of, of insight, and insight is the wisdom that releases from um, selfhood, sense of being an autonomous, isolated agent or object or subject, recipient of experience and from a sense of permanence and from the need to find uh, completion or satisfaction in conditioned phenomena in thoughts, feelings, sensations that they should somehow be conclusive satisfying fulfilling mm. it's dukkha so dukkha unsatisfactoriness sounds like a pretty miserable kind of realization <laughs> but actually what it's about is saying you know, don't expect this stuff to be uh, complete fulfilling final finished conclusive decisive the one thing the thing that you got it, that's it. There isn't one. <laughs> so releasing from that means there's a whole lot of searching and possessing and, uh, you know, buying into um, things that can't actually fulfill. So that's release from that. doesn't mean we're released into misery, but through knowing the limitations of thoughts sights, sounds, feelings, perceptions, views, bodies, there's this passion, there's release from that. Mm. Mm. So what is released? Is it some kind of self? No, there's release from that too. (laughs) Is it some kind of permanent state? No, there's release from that also. So this release can't really be defined apart from uh, the highest ease. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it's not the one thing. If you want to find the one thing, the one thing you could say is clarity. <clears throat> clarity about this. And release. So clarity is our, our main practice and uh, for insight, specific clarity, being very clear about what's actual. So we don't have to affirm, believe, affirm something that we assume. Just to be clear about what actually happens. So for this is dependent on calming the mind. So vipassana is the kind of wisdom that can only arise when the mind is calm. So it's not that they're contradictory. Samatha is not contradictory to vipassana. Samatha is a requirement for insight because unless the mind is steady and stable, you can't really do the kind of scrutiny and investigation because the water's too too rough the mind is too uneven to really contemplate so a lot of our practice always comes down just to calming brightening easing opening steadying stabilizing soothing blessing lifting <laughs> you know it's that is the is the 90 percent of it isn't it mm seeing the bits that we're stuck on. <clears throat> but then, uh, you know, we still get the idea, and I think one, one of the, of course, the, the limitation of samadhi is that you do find the mind seems very solid and settled, this is the one thing. Now, I've got a mind is settled and solid, I want to have that state where my mind feels settled and solid and happy, that's the one thing to get and of course um, so 
we begin to contemplate that one thing, you realize that, well, there's several things there. The first of all was the intention to support it. There's the attention, focus on an object. There's the perception, sense of space or brightness. Mm. There's the feeling, subtle pleasure. That's not one thing, that's several things already. Mm. And they are naturally with samadhi, those are kind of held in a, in a good balance. But they're really separate things and all of them are subject to change. Intention can change, attention can change, you know, suddenly your attention can shift to something else and the thing starts to fall apart. Perceptions, we can get dazzled by lights and limiters and so forth, but they can change. Energy can change. Feel sick, tired, can't get there. So it really is dependently arisen, uh, any kind of mind state. And with when the mind is collected and calm, you can get to see that more clearly. It's dependently arisen. This is arisen through energy, effort, attention, intention. And it gives rise to perception, feeling, states of consciousness. All this is subject to change. You, know, you can't, it's not, it's a, it's a beautiful art, it's a beautiful crafted state of mind, but that's, that's it. But through that, you, you, you've definitely, one does a lot of uh, good work in terms of steadying att- intention, becomes determined, patient, skillful. It's not hard, it's not floppy, it's, it's kind of flexible, but aiming. You prune away a lot of the distracting aims and goals. <clears throat> attention becomes a, a long span of attention. Sustaining attention for you know, an hour, you know, hours after hours of sustaining attention. So this is great. But it's not the one thing, because it changes. So often with the (coughs) insight, you get presented with these lists of factors. You know, like we're chanting the Vipassana Bhumi, the Indriyas, the Yatanas, the Datus, the dependent arising. Dependent arising is the theme of insight. You know, things, apparent things are really synchronicities, things coming together that give rise to an apparent something that then shifts and changes, rather like patterns on flowing water. You know, these particular patterns come up because of the currents and the temperature and the fluidity of water, and it's continually shifting, dependent and rising. And this, uh, this of course, is one of the you know, two major you know, themes of, that are specific to the Buddha Dhamma. Another being the Four Noble Truths, dependent arising, because dependent arising is a presentation that removes any sense of um, the one thing, which can become some kind of self. Even attention can become, oh, I am the watcher. That's what I am. This is my real self, watching stuff come and go. Well, no, that's not. Who's that? You know, I am the awareness that knows things arise and cease. Who's the, you know? Well, that's a, that's attention, isn't it? Watching is attention, and intention—the intention to watch. 
and perception, noticing things. That's not one thing, that's at least three things already. So clarity is, this is why this, these are insight teachings are often lists showing you the different factors that are coming together. And of course you don't have to know all this stuff intellectually, but to get the feeling for it. So you're continually looking into. And I was suggesting yesterday taking a theme from the Patisim Sambhidamaga, which is a late canonical work and the four bases of selfhood one is the sense of abiding I am this I am in this state this is what I am another one is um, agency I am the cause of this because I open my eyes I see that yeah. Another one is uh, the recipient. This is happening to me. And another one is uh, mastery, autonom- autonomous mastery. I can I can make things happen by myself. I can I can get things to do something. I am effective, agent, autonomous, not needing other things to happen. When you spell it out. You begin to get the feeling of, oh, oh <laughs> I know where this could go. <laughs> you know, arrogance, <laughs> insensitivity. Uh, or uh, terrible aloneness or helplessness. You know, I am, I am the, the one that things happen to. You know, so I'm stuck on the end, I'm a dartboard, walking dartboard. continually impinged upon. So all this is dukkha. I was saying yesterday looking into abiding. So what is abiding? Contemplate stability of mind, there's awareness, there's perceptions, the feeling, energy. There isn't some person, there isn't an entity there. There's that. You can abide internally. There's going to be abiding externally. We can get into what we're looking at. Just notice in a day, without any you know, intense concentration, just being clear. Here I'm reading a book, I'm abiding in that story. You know, my mind is in that. Here I am sweeping the path, my mind is now sweeping path, it's abiding in that, if you're focused. Or it could be abiding in confusion, or restlessness. And all these abidings really are very temporary, aren't they? And conditioned and caught, and if there was no book, you wouldn't be reading. If there was nothing to see, you wouldn't be abiding in seeing. Because the mind has such huge domains, we can always abide in some state or another, seemingly abiding in unhappiness or abiding in happiness. But they change, don't they? So there's no abiding, really. There's clarity. When you begin to, well, what's the point of that? You begin to realize, well, then instead of that tenacity to hold on, to some state or fear or defend oneself, you can allow these abidings to move through and calming and kindness and clarity and ethical integrity all allow these abidings to move. <coughs> and that's what you want. <coughs> you don't want to abide because if there's an abiding, it becomes somebody who is abiding in it. And then when that thing shifts, they've been thrown out of their house again. They've got to find another one. <laughs> like being a squatter. <laughs> you 
just as you're settling into that, the bailiffs turn up and bolt you out of the door again. So it's better to not abide and you can't get evicted. <laughs> but you can be clear and allow and respond and relate to what's happening in a clear way. <clears throat> this is our training, isn't it? <clears throat> We're homeless ones. Naturally, that brings up, you know, uncertainties because if I'm homeless, maybe I'm also defenseless. What's going to happen to me? The one who receives experience. And what should I do? Where should I go? How should I live my life? So agency becomes important. And what happens to us becomes important. We can become kind of defensive, I don't want to have those things happen to me. <clears throat> I'd like to have those things happen to me. All natural enough concerns. But naturally, with that, there's always going to be some kind of worry, anxiety, mm, yeah. restlessness. What does it take to say, well, what happens to me? You can only you can't have a lot of choice. You can have some choice, but not much. And noticing what does happen to me really is feeling painful, feeling pleasant, feeling neutral, feeling perceptions and impressions. Can we cultivate, train with that to feel feeling, allow feeling to be felt? Painful feeling, pleasant feeling, neutral feeling. If it's clearly known as feeling, and there's a proper relationship and response to that, feeling can move through and dissolve. There doesn't have to be somebody on the end of the arrow. <clears throat> now, this is this is a, you know an aim, an aspiration to that realization. It gives us something to keep looking at. Because, yeah, you know, when painful feeling happens, it happens definitely, <laughs> it seems like it's me on the end of it. <laughs> but that's the point, isn't it? We get to that bit and, oh, come on, you know, feeling is feeling. It's this. It's not motivated. It's not trying to hurt me. It's just doing what it's supposed to do. Can it move through? Because, you know, that's what we have to work with, being with feeling. Being the, so not being the recipient of it. Dependently arisen. Seeing something depends upon there being a visual object, an eye organ, consciousness. Mm. It's coming together of those three is contact. And contact, internal impression, perception, internalizes that experience and there I am on the end of it. Seeing things. <coughs> And naturally, because of that, uh, the intensity of that, that experience of contact, the mind being affected, awareness being affected, then we become responsible. Clarity gives rise to responsibility as to what I'm actually going to put my attention onto, you know, which is not going to generate huge amounts of strong feeling, calming. And then how much mental contact, that is stuff that the mind receives, is its own feeling, 
something one could do something about. If I don't have hatred in my mind, if I don't have doubt in my mind, if I don't have anxiety in my mind, if I don't have you know, a craving in my mind, if that those very unpleasant feelings don't have to arise. Yeah. Then I don't have to kind of keep dealing with that. So intention, agency, really our agency as such is quite limited. Mm. You can't really say even obvious things like you can't really choose to see a particular thing. Mm. You really notice clearly, specifically, you may think, oh, I'll go and have a look at a tree or look at the day. That notion, but actually what you see is always slightly different from what one imagines or expects. Specifically, things arise by themselves and not because of my decision. There's no real agency in that. You want to go and see Bill, Bill is not in. Or you have this idea of Bill, nice, good old Bill who helps me out, and turn up, Bill's having a bad day. He's not there, he's not in that, set, that state he wanted to be in. Bill will solve my problem, I'll go and see Bill. Bill doesn't know the answer. Oh. oh. <laughs> Bill's sick. Oh. You know, so... What we aim for is not what we get, is it? It's always slightly different. So there's no real agency. There's intention, a kind of rising up of an impulse. What you get is different. You begin to recognize that, that what you seek, what you intend, and what you get are different things you get a lot more relaxed about intention. (laughs) Because you know you're not going to get it. (laughs) Yeah. You're not going to get the perfect banana. You're going to get sort of going to a fruit shop, you get something, but it won't be quite the perfect banana you had in mind. So with that, you start to get a little bit, well, you know, (laughs) intention becomes less domineering and uh, starts to lighten and relax. And that's really helpful, isn't it? But when agency becomes self, then I have to get what I want. Otherwise, I feel frustrated, failing, inadequate, incompetent, not getting what I want. But you turn it around, think, well, rather than getting what I want, I want what I get. (laughs) Contentment turns that way, doesn't it? And this is very important when we meditate, of course, because when we meditate, this is the, the, the biggest banana in the shop, isn't it? You know, it's going to be clear, peaceful, tranquil, resolving problems, dealing with issues, sorted, you know, buoyant. And you go into the meditation shop with that intention, and what do you get? Seeking, wanting, struggling, trying to create something that happened yesterday, trying to have an experience that you read in a book, so we always come back to our intention in meditation is to open, to relax, just come into the body, calm.
And then look at specifically what is arising and how you respond to it. It doesn't matter, the rest of it. You know? And just that free from doubt that you just have to work with anxiety for 10 years. You know, or however, however long it takes, it doesn't matter really because that's what's arising. And if one is much more willing to be with that, then it will, you're gonna, that's going to resolve itself a lot more clearly than in, you know, always making a problem that one shouldn't have. So this issue around agency and competence and is really a, a big one to see through. This is where selfhood lingers. Who, you know, you find yourself competing against the ideals. Hmm? Running a race against an ideal. And the ideal will always beat you every time. It will always run faster. It will always climb higher. It will always last longer than you do. Because ideals don't have to... <laughs> they don't have to deal with existence. So what's it like, you know, to not be ideal, to not... It's, it's clear. That's what it's like. Clear, specific, meet what arises. This is relationship, clear relationship. If there's the one thing, it's clarity, you could say the one thing is the, another one thing is the understand clinging. Another one thing is to understand craving. These are the one things. What um, tends to obscure the characteristics is uh, the characteristic of dukkha is obscured by movement. That is, just as things getting a bit unsatisfactory, the mind jumps to something else. Oh well, off to that, or the body, or attention goes somewhere else. We don't really see, follow things through to the, you know, ending of something, and that pause when. That didn't quite, it's gone, hasn't it? That moment of clarity or knowing is, oh, yeah, that inconclusive. Solidity obscures the sense of realization of not self. And this is a big one because surely. We'd like to feel secure, and wouldn't security be about feeling solid? Hmm? Wouldn't security be about being solid? Well, depends on the on the medium. Hmm? Rocks don't do very well in water; they tend to sink. (laughs) They're solid but they're not very secure. If you're living in a world of change, solidity doesn't really work. But uh, fluidity, balance, poise, hmm, letting go, that, that helps, that keeps you afloat. So whenever we start to feel we're getting settled and solid, then check it out. So it's not bad, but uh, really, um, you know, <laughs> it can get uh, build some difficult things on that. You know, complacency or 
opinionatedness. Being fluid is better than being solid. And through that, what does become more realized is the way, not a thing, but the way, the Dhamma is a way, not a thing, a way of non-attachment, the way of dispassion, the way of relinquishment. way of clarity. These are the one things. And they're all saying they'll be saying the same thing really. So in terms of the way of Dhamma, insight offers that opening to the way of Dhamma. When you begin to Realize what all the one thing is to free, free up. Noticing with intention, agency, directive, motivation, impulse. This is accompanied by, where's it coming from? Is it restless? Is it generous? Is it resistant? Is it? or don't even know where it's coming from. Attention. When one attends to something, gives attention to something, what's that accompanied by? Accompanied by obsession, or awareness, Receptivity. Contact. What's that accompanied by? Mm. What are those contact impressions accompanied by? Wavering. Resisting. Holding on. So you notice really, you can kind of almost get it down to just these three bases at intention, Attention, what you're, what you're holding, how you're holding something. Intention, what you're aiming for. Contact, how things are affecting. You notice, you contemplate, look insightfully into those experiences. Where's the snagging? Where's the grasping? Where's the clinging? Where is it going, getting stuck? And then releasing. So I noticed even like, you know, going out, doing some walking meditation, you walk up and down and, you know, you get to the end of the path and here we are again. That's clinging. You never hear again. There's no such thing as again. If your mind is going another hour of this, another half an hour of this, it's stop, pause, check, what's your, what's happening? We're not attending specifically to what needs to be attended to. We're feeling bored or fed up. Uh huh. Pause, stop. Where's that? Is it in your body? No. Is it in the path? No. So just get back to the body walking the path. You begin to reveal these uh, places where we attention gets stuck or intention gets bored, doesn't want to bother. Yeah. Attention on breathing. When you're trying to hold it together, fix on the one point, hold it. How does that feel? Tense? Mm. Expecting, trying to arrive at somewhere, that intention, what is that, what's the result of that? So it really is uh, 
loosening and freeing up the way in which awareness operates till it becomes very malleable and applicable in all situations. It it starts to mean all your life really is a meditation. Once you begin to see the signs, note the signs, note the hit, note the snags, note what release is about, note what the shift is about. Then that's the point, I th- to my mind, of insight. Is it from meditation practice, you know, which is your your entry point, path of insight, opens that out to become a whole way of life.